Uh, thank you. My story is actually probably at the other end of the scale to the one that we've just heard because my school is 135 years old. Uh, so I will be uh, having a little bit of a different story. <laughs> Uh, yes, so I just wanted to talk to you about how achieving success for all students is possible, even in a very established school with a history of tradition. Uh, and that is possible because uh, I have a principal with a very strong vision, a strong will, and uh, if you haven't spoken to him at the conference, he is here today, uh, easy to spot. He's always got bow ties on. He has a bow tie on today. I don't know where he is, but he could wave his hand if he's in here. And I, I think anyone who wants to know how to make change, uh, make t a time to speak to my principal, Doug Thomas. So my aim today is to talk to you about how you can move from exclusion to inclusion. And this is just a brief overview of what that looks like in Australia, uh, because prior to the early 1900s, there would have been many children out there with disabilities who were excluded from schooling. Uh, and then going into the mid 70s, uh, normalisation began, or the term normalisation, and integration began. And then by 1992, we had the Disability Discrimination Act saying that it was actually basically against the law to discriminate against children. Uh, and now, of course, we've moved to inclusion. And since the Salamanca statement, uh, we are promoting full inclusion. And the school that I'll be speaking about today is promoting full inclusion. So my story, uh, 30 years in education, and even though I wasn't uh, around in the early 1900s, my mother certainly was. And so she started school in the 1900s and being the mother of six children, I'm number five, five girls, one boy, my mother really instilled in all of us the importance of education. Uh, she herself had to leave school uh, before she finished school, being the female in the family, uh, the males got to continue schooling and my mother had to go out to work after she'd done a certain number of years of schooling. So it was very much instilled in us that education is for everyone. But when we look at children with disabilities or students with disabilities, also in, my mother used to speak about a young girl that she lived next door to who wasn't allowed to go to school because she had a disability. So luckily we've come a long way since then, in Australia at least. So in the 60s when I started school, uh, I definitely experienced segregation, not myself, but I remember a little boy that used to go to our church, and I remember his name because my name's Brenda, his name was Brendan, and I remember asking my mum one day, why doesn't this little boy come to our school? He was the same age as me, and um, she said, oh, well, he's legally blind. He's actually, he can't go to a regular mainstream school. So, um, why I remember that is because uh, I, I felt it was very unfair um, that he couldn't, just because he was legally blind, couldn't go to a regular school with regular children and, and make friends with us, even though we could see him at church. 35 years later, I met Brendan. Uh, he worked at the University of Melbourne in the area of uh, staff. Um, he, he, he took my photo for my staff ID. Uh, so here's someone legally blind and his job was to take photos of staff members and it was one of the best photos I've ever had of myself. Uh, and I just think it's important that I just remembered him right back from 35 years ago. And then by the time I got into secondary school, uh, normalisation or integration had started and there were children in my year or students in my year that definitely had learning uh, difficulties. I don't know if you would have called them disabilities, but uh, and they were definitely integrated into my school. Uh, by the time I finished and was graduating as a teacher, uh, definitely include, uh, in integration was well underway. My very first year of teaching, I had five children in my very first class. Um, children who were integrated with ADHD. Uh, one was a elective mute. Um, but you know, a range of children and in those days you were just thrown in at the deep end and you just did whatever you could. Uh, we didn't have support in any way 
but after I had worked at that school that had 49 different nationalities, so we also had very high uh, English as a second language needs in those grades. By the third year of working at that school, I was actually the integration coordinator and um, my passion for supporting students with special needs had definitely begun by then. So I spent then 12 years in schools, uh, working with mainly in the area of special education and inclusion, uh, looking at how I could support and upskill teachers uh, so that I was trying to find out all the supports that were out there that I could actually bring into the school to help these students. And then I moved to the Children's Hospital where I worked in inclusion by connecting children in their beds to their schools. Um, you know, you think of adolescents who are in hospital and they're thinking, great, I'm getting out of school. No, if they're long-term patients, the first thing they want to do is actually have those links back to their schools. So I was head of a project called Maintaining Connections for Students and Young People in Hospital. So that was a, a great five years of my life. And then I moved to working at the Women's Hospital, helping uh, parenting mothers or mothers aged 14 to 18 to help them make connections back to their schools and integrate them back into education. I then moved to the University of Melbourne where on a one year contract after 14 years at Melbourne Uni, uh, I, I suppose what my job was there at Melbourne Uni was a lot of theory about inclusion and why it's important and training a whole lot of teachers. And then after 18 years, oh, I also worked with John Hattie in visible learning for a year and at Sydney University in the area of inclusion. And then after 18 years out of schools, I returned to a school. And I was able to then return to a school and put all that theory that I had been researching, etc., into practice. So I'd just like you to have a look at this uh, comic here to think about which school you might be out of these two. So my school definitely falls into the second. This is not always ringing. Uh, so I, just briefly, I am a school I work at a school in Sydney. Uh, my school is called Claremont College. We are 135 years old this year, and that's a picture of how the school used to look in 1882 when it first started. And as I said before, we have a vision for our school, which is um, success for all students. And that vision includes inclusive education for all children and how we do that is through flexible learning spaces, co-teaching and integrated learning support, which I'll run you through now. So when we started this uh, plan, it was about mid-2012, uh, mid and this is what our classrooms looked like, and I'm sure many of your classrooms look the same, pretty pokey, uh, about 30 children, and then we decided to open up our spaces and to think about how can flexible learning spaces uh, start that process of inclusion and um, uh, making gains for all students. So going from pokey corridors to things like this. So again, as you can imagine, a 135 year old building, we couldn't knock down too many walls because there's heritage uh, overlays. And so now we were able to have these types of spaces within those existing uh, walls. And what this allows for then is lots of movement. Uh, the children aren't sitting in lines, the children are able to sit wherever they want. Uh, the furniture is very comfortable, children will sit on the floor, on chairs. We have a kitchen table in every single one of our classrooms to allow children to sit around that bench or table and work. Uh, so it's like bringing the home into the school and we then introduced co-teaching. So in every single one of our classes from kindergarten through to year six, we have co-teaching at all levels. What this looks like is two or more people in every classroom. So we combine two classrooms, so we now have 60 children and a minimum of two adults or two teachers in that room. Uh, and what our aim for that was is to actually learn from each other. So we always, well, we often talk about being able to go into another classroom and see how someone else teaches. We now have two teachers in the classroom together learning from each other. 
And so we moved from to, uh, predominantly staff working in isolation, classroom teacher in that room, uh, learning assistants coming in and out of the classroom, helping, doing photocopying, making cups of tea, that sort of thing, and the learning support teachers um, doing work in isolation, to now a team of teachers working in the classroom together. So this is what a, a classroom would normally look like, two teachers out the front, well not always out the front, but two teachers in the room. And so we also then integrated our learning support. So before there was a lot of withdrawal intervention rooms, one-to-one uh, -one small group work with uh, teachers or a special ed teacher, and those children generally worked on a completely different program to the rest of their peers. Uh, so you might see kids in a little separate room, etc. And now um, we have two to three teachers in every room and we have a teaching and learning assistant in every classroom permanently. So that's what I mean about a principal with a vision. He's actually thought about, okay, where should we be spending you know, this bucket of money we have? Uh, we believe that putting a learning assistant in each classroom was a, a good resource. So the normal model for co-teaching and learning support is the general educator and the special educator whereas our uh, co-teaching is a series of different teachers with different skills in the room. So now everything takes in place in the classroom. So learning takes place in the classroom. If a child is um, out of, uh, behaving out of um, what we would expect, behaviour management comes into the classroom. Social skills training happens in the classroom. It's no more you're sent to the principal's office or you're sent to the deputy's office. Everything's done in the classroom. Uh, so this is a group of children with learning needs, uh, but working within the classroom with, in that case, with a um, special educator. So now our classroom teams have two to three teachers in every room, a teaching and learning assistant, learning support teacher works in the room for as many literacy and numeracy lessons as we can, and a school counsellor and behaviour support also happens in the room. So here's what our teams generally look like. The first one is a year three team, a year six team, and our kindergarten team. So our mission for our learning support was to provide a fully inclusive approach to learning support where children within the, the co-teaching um, model and the flexible learning spaces, children could, their needs could be addressed uh, by the experts in the room. So that additional staffing that we have allows for more differentiated instruction in smaller groups and um, tailoring our learning to those students' needs. So not only do we have uh, differentiated learning, but we also have differentiated assessment, which we've just only recently introduced, where children don't have to then sit uh, you know, you do all this differentiated learning and then they have to sit the same test as every other child. So we also differentiate our assessment and I saw this lovely cartoon yesterday, but for those of you who haven't seen it. So it's really important to take it right through that it's not just in the teaching but it's in the assessment, etc., where we support our children uh, with diverse needs. The other resources and tools that we celebrate in our school to make this happen are the expertise of our staff. So all of our staff do training. Uh, we look at the needs of our school rather than going outside the school. We bring people into the school so that we're targeting any PD that we have to the specific needs of our students. So in these photos, the school counsellor is in there. We've got the office staff in there. We've got the learning support in there. Uh, so everyone hears the same language, hears the same PD. Our students are also a very big um, resource. I think we can't underestimate even um, our youngsters. So this student here is five their ability to adapt and show us how to use technologies and things is amazing so we have to just not be scared and uh, utilise our students and their expertise. Even our big students, no, that's one of our kindergarten teachers, he was modelling to our kindergarten students how a, um, you should put your hand up. And the other thing is that students are really good at teaching each other, as you can imagine. So we really like to upskill our students. So this is a group of year 
six students supporting some year one students. And so just making sure that we actually utilise all the expertise in the school. So we have a saying at our school, the answer is in the room. And so instead of always going out and getting experts and paying a lot of money for experts to come in to do a generic uh, PD, we actually say, no, we've actually got a lot of talent on our staff and we believe that we can actually find a solution. We also use a lot of flexible learning groups. So I was speaking to a group earlier today where we screen all our kindergarten students when they come to school. And so from day one, we have an indicator, an indication of any children that may be struggling, even from their first day of school. And we make sure that we spread that um, selection of children across the classes so that we don't have um, ability grouping classes. So we have heterogeneous classes, but within those classes we of course have opportunity for ability grouping, passion projects, um, we do PBL which is project based learning, but there's a lot of uh, movement in our groups. Technology plays a big part in our school, we've just moved to one to one device um, where the parents were given a levy. Uh, uh, it was a fairly small levy because we um, leased the computers instead of buying them and so from five years of age up to um, year six our students have one-to-one -one devices and in this way it just doesn't um, make the children who have uh, diverse needs stand out. All children have the technology that they require, they have the apps that they require. So we do a lot of uh, use of text-to-speech, speech-to-text, uh, but it, those children now aren't seen as being different than every other child. They all use it because we follow the... Um, uh, oh, I've lost my words, but we, we use the um, UDL approach, I suppose, of making sure that whatever we do supports all children because I, I really love this next slide. Clearing the path for our children with special needs clears the path for everybody. So we really try to take an approach at our school of whatever benefits one child will probably benefit all of students. So in conclusion, we're on a journey to success. We don't claim to be there yet, but we're definitely well on our way. Uh, we haven't arrived there yet, but each year we make another step towards our goal. We stick to our guns, and even though we've got um, a parent body who are very strong uh, and strong in tradition, we've brought them along the journey, and success is in our reach. So what have we done? We have our new learning spaces, which provide flexibility and inclusivity. The co-teaching has allowed for collaboration, communication, improved uh, relationships, and of course, improved learning outcomes and the integrated learning support and differentiation allows all of our students to be included in learning with their peers in their classrooms. So just remember the iceberg model. It might look as though we've got all this success happening, but there's been a lot of things happening uh, behind the scenes, uh, a bit like a duck paddling in water under the, under the water. You don't see that they're paddling madly on the top. They look all calm. So success for us is a little bit like that. It's a, it's a bit of a journey. So thinking about your school, are you the number one school or a number two school? And if you are a number one school, I advise you to jump in, have a go. Your students uh, deserve you to have a go and not wait until you get it perfect because no one gets it perfect the first time. Jump in, stick to your guns, but make sure of course that what you're doing is based in research and uh, do your own research. So we couldn't find a lot out there in our model of co-teaching, so we did our own research, and we've actually uh, been on the journey of a three-year um, research project now in our own context on whether co-teaching is improving outcomes for our students. And I will leave you with a quote from this beautiful woman. Thank you.
important. We have a few minutes available for questions, so I'd like to open the questions to the floor. Do we have any questions for Brenda, please? Brenda, I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Um, managing the community expectations and perceptions can be problematic, depending. Uh, would you say that your community, your parents, were very supportive of the changes to become more inclusive from the outset, or did you need to uh, educate them as well as uh, other members in the community? Uh, definitely in hindsight, we would have done a lot more education before we jumped in. Uh, so I think communication is paramount, making sure that your parents are on board and having a good understanding. So if you can't verbalise what you mean by co-teaching prior to um, jumping in and, and speaking to your parents about it, um, I'd suggest you do. We, yes, we lost some parents along the way, so therefore lost some students. Uh, we lost some teachers along the way. Uh, not large numbers, but... Uh, but yeah, that's why I'm saying success is like an iceberg. We're there now, we feel that we have done the right things, we've stuck to our guns, we believe it has been a fantastic move, but yes, there have been losses along the way. But communication, communication, communication to your parents and bring them along the way with you. Thank you, and I, I remember yesterday Doug uh, mentioning that he felt good when he was able to say, ah yes, we knew it would be good for our kids and now we have some evidence that it is good for our kids because there was that concern yeah. when they sat tests or whatnot that there wouldn't be the, the growth. So how long do you feel it's going to be before you can confidently um, maybe share data to show the difference, to, to be able to say, look, this is the data, this is actually a, a better way forward. How long do you think that might be? Uh, we can do that now. So we've been um, collecting data since prior to the co-teaching change and so we have longitudinal data already. So we've got five years of data. Our students sit a standardised test every October which is purely to see if they have made 12 months or more growth in 12 months and that's from year one basically through to year six and those results arrived on my computer on Friday just before I flew here. So my first job when I get back is to have a look at that um, growth. But we've been lucky, uh, not lucky, we're hard working school, we had good results, we want to maintain and improve um, even though we've got very good results. Yeah, I remember the graphs that he shared, um, they would be results that would be hard to live up to if you, if you yeah. didn't have everything in together. All right, well thank you very much and everyone please a warm thank you to Brenda for sharing her information with us.